Welcome to Care Coordination and Interoperable Health IT Systems, Ensuring the Security and Privacy of Information Shared. This is Lecture B, Ensuring Compliance. The objectives for this unit, Ensuring the Security and Privacy of Information Shared, Lecture B, Ensuring Compliance, are Assess processes and systems to ensure compliance with applicable privacy and security regulations during care coordination and explain the challenges of establishing, preserving, and restoring trust from multiple stakeholder perspectives. So in terms of ensuring compliance, the first thing a person has to do is determine if you are subject to the HIPAA rules and regulations. Those subject to HIPAA specifically are health plans, i.e. insurance companies, healthcare providers in all settings, so hospitals, clinics, home health. If you touch a person to provide healthcare to them, you are a healthcare provider. Healthcare clearinghouses. Typically, these are data warehouses or data processing companies. If you are a business associate of any of the above entities, meaning you do work on their behalf under a contract, and you have access to protected health information or individually identifiable health information, then you are totally subject to all of the rules and regulations of the HIPAA Privacy Act. And if you are handling electronic health information, you are also subject to the HIPAA Security Act. A link to CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, Decision Aid is available for you on the references slide at the end of this lecture. If you are unsure whether or not you are subject to HIPAA, it is strongly encouraged that you go to this online tool and follow the Decision Aid to find out whether or not this is the case. So when we talk about the privacy rule and the security rule, specifically, what are we talking about? Under the privacy rule, we have quite a few administrative requirements, policies, and procedures. So how do you protect privacy and what do you do if there is a problem related to privacy for a particular patient? Each covered entity has to designate a privacy officer. There has to be a single point of contact who has responsibility for privacy in that organization. It does not have to be a full-time position. However, there has to be one person who understands that they are the privacy officer and responsible for ensuring your compliance with the HIPAA Privacy Act. You need to have workforce training and management of that workforce, and you need to document that training. When a covered entity hires someone new, it is typical for the new hire to go through a HIPAA training seminar and then receive annual updates to ensure that they are current with the requirements for HIPAA. You have to have a plan for mitigation in the case of a breach of privacy or a breach of confidentiality. Let's say someone gets a hold of a record they are not supposed to have. How do you handle that? How do you mitigate any damage that might be done? You need to have safeguards for your data. We'll talk more extensively about safeguards when we cover the Security Act, but safeguards can include things like having locks on doors. You need to have a way for clients and patients to make complaints should they feel their privacy has been threatened or even breached. You have to have a policy that prevents retaliation for anyone who has reported breaches of privacy, and you have to have a waiver process for that. And finally, you have to document and retain records around all of your activities related to the Privacy Act. The security rule, which goes hand in hand with the Privacy Act, has its own specific requirements. For example, you must implement a risk management plan meaning what are the potential risks to your electronic information security infrastructure and what are you doing to minimize those risks. Again, just as with privacy, you must select a security official or a security officer, someone who is in charge of ensuring the security of electronic health information in your organization. This does not have to be a full-time position, 
but someone does have to understand they are and act as your security officer. And then finally, you need to develop and implement procedures to respond to and report security incidents. Specifically, something we all hope never happens, which is a security breach. Also under the security rule, you need to have a data backup plan and a disaster recovery plan. If you are along the Gulf Coast in the United States and a hurricane hits, what is your plan? What is your plan to maintain your data? What is your plan to recover from that? If you are in California in an earthquake area, what is your plan to maintain your data? What is your plan to recover from that? You also need to have plans for a lack of electricity. How are you going to handle your information system with that? Will your information remain protected? These are all plans that you have to think of. So you have to develop and implement an emergency mode operation plan. This would be the plan that would go into force should you lose electricity. You need to implement methods for the final disposal of electronic protected health information. So if you are rotating laptop computers for healthcare providers, how do you dispose of the old laptop computers to ensure protected health information on that computer will not be able to be accessed and would not be at risk for a breach? Under the security rule, you must ensure that all system users have been assigned a unique identifier. For example, there should be no joint identifier for all of the people working in the emergency room or in the intensive care unit. Each user on a given system must have a unique identifier so that audit logs can be created and it is known who accessed which information and where. And finally, under the security rule, there is the addressable item, which means it is not always required of encryption and decryption of protected health information. And the reason it's mentioned here is that encryption and decryption can help prevent breaches. Let's talk a little bit about breaches. There is a risk assessment of a breach where you need to examine all of your protection for your protected health information, including issues like monitor placement, physical locks on doors to server rooms, anything that could potentially lead to a breach. And you have to assess the risk. If it's determined to be a high risk, you have to mitigate it. Most importantly, what you really want to do is render the protected health information unusable, unreadable, or indecipherable to unauthorized individuals. Both when it's in transit, i.e. we're transmitting it, whether that's through a health information exchange, or an email, or a text message, or any other method of transmission. You may also consider doing it when the information is at rest or stored in a database or stored in a clinical data warehouse. So, if the PHI is unusable, unreadable, or indecipherable to unauthorized individuals, it becomes much, much secure. Let's say the worst does happen and there's been a breach. You've determined that unauthorized individuals have accessed electronic protected health information at your organization. This then means you now have to have a plan for breach notification. So in terms of notification, you must notify all of the clients or patients whose information you believe may have been breached. So you have to try to contact those individuals and you need to document your attempts to contact those individuals. You have to try to contact them within 30 days of the day you became aware of the breach. So it's not necessarily 30 days from when the breach occurred because if the hacker was really good, the breach may have occurred and you may not have discovered it for two months. Once you determine that the breach has occurred, you then have 30 days to notify those individuals. You need to document your methods attempting to notify them. Are you going to send them written notification or are you going to try to email them at their latest email? Are you going to hire a company to try to contact them by phone? So how are you going to notify them? 
and then you're going to document those attempts to notify them and you're going to document when you can't reach them. What is going to be the content of that notification? Are you going to pay for risk mitigation for these individuals? So, a credit monitoring service or some other service that you're going to provide because the breach happened from your information. If the number of records that were determined to be breached total 500 or more, you must also notify the local media in your area. So, that means you have to notify newspapers, television, radio, so that they can let their local area know that this breach has occurred and what persons who believe they may be at risk for that breach need to do to contact you to address it from their perspective. Again, you also have to notify the Secretary of Health and Human Services and they actually post breaches of 500 records or more on their website. Breach notification is serious and you need to have a plan for it. What are some of the steps that the organization can take to prevent breaches? One of the first ones is to make it a priority. Make it part of the organizational culture that we take the security of the protected health information very seriously and we include an adequate budget and resources for it. Review your policies, especially around your policies of opt-in versus opt-out for certain information and for what patients can do. We'll talk more about opt-in versus opt-out in a later lecture. Have your privacy and security officers recognized as senior administration. So they need to have decision-making capabilities and they need to be recognized as authorities in the organization. You need to track and monitor the access to protected data. Who is going to access the data? Is it within the bounds of their job? Is it appropriate? Use advanced techniques to test security. Wargaming, use white hat hackers. So the good guys who come in and try to hack your system, there are companies who do this now. You can also get certified for security in certain parts of the country. Establish proactive risk management, including monitoring of your third party providers. Because if your business associate has a breach, you also become liable for that. Establishing consumer trust of the data is also very important. You want to provide transparency in your policies and actions. And if a breach occurs, you want to be very proactive in addressing it. Be judicious about collecting and sharing data. Obviously, we are here talking about care coordination and sharing data under care coordination is an allowed activity. But don't collect data just to collect data. Make sure you have a reason for collecting the data. Inform your consumers about your security measures, about what you're doing to protect their data. It helps them to be assured of what's going on. Protect your consumers if at all possible. Put screen filters on your screens. Utilize encrypted computers. Encrypt thumb drives. Have your providers use encrypted smartphones. Protect your consumers and be active about it. Be prepared and work it into your budget to potentially compensate for security lapses should you have any. And if there is a breach, you have to be prepared to regain consumers' trust. This concludes Lecture B, Ensuring Compliance of Unit 10, Ensuring the Security and Privacy of Information Shared. In summary, the process of care coordination does require knowledge of and compliance with the privacy and security rule. You can't share the information without the knowledge of these regulations. Encryption is a very important part of protecting against a breach with the data both when it's being transmitted and when it is being stored. But ultimately, trusting the security of data is a multifaceted problem.